This video covers financial institutions and regulations. Specifically, we'll cover geographic restrictions, interest rate ceilings on banks, international banking and its impact on the euro dollar market, LIBOR, and so forth, which is a new interest rate that's coming out. We'll look at deposit insurance in the FDIC. We'll cover risk-based capital requirements. We'll cover an example in that area. Then we'll look at firewalling commercial banking from investment banking. Each one of these topics could go on for hundreds of pages in detail. It's not my point here. My point is to give you just enough context and information about how banks are regulated so that we can move further into the course and continue to look at banking. So let's begin by talking about bank geographic restrictions. And what we mean by bank geographic restrictions is limitations on the size of banks in terms of their number of branches. This is often referred to as banking structure. And what economists mean by banking structure is, well, what does the distribution of banks look like? How many banks are out there? How many branches are out there? How big are they? And how big are they relative to other countries? So let's take a look at the, just the number of banks here. So in the United States, we have over 5,000 banks today. And in Canada, there's 29 banks. France has 400, Japan 200, and the UK 200. Even if you adjust for population, there are huge differences here in the number of banks. How can you possibly explain that? How can you explain the differences in banking structure? Like I said, as economists would refer to this as. Well, you got to look back to the history. Believe it or not, you got to go back to the revolutionary times. Recall when we went and looked at money, the history of money, and we looked at the history of money, we started off in the 1700s talking about how there was a lot of argument going on in this country as it was just forming as to wh where the power would reside in the country. Many people wanted the states to have a lot of rights so that then there would be no centralization because we just got done fighting England and England was looked at as, as a monarchy, you know, centralized authority. And the people in the United States, the people who fought the Revolutionary War, they fought against those ideas. So they wanted the states here to have a lot of power and not have it centralized. And that's what Thomas Jefferson and James Madison were all about. They wanted to spread authority across the states. Then you had people like Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton, and what he wanted to do and what he saw was there needs to be centralization because if you don't have centralization, the country would be too vulnerable to attack from outside as well as inside through a civil war. Hamilton feared that some states would try to dominate others and that fighting would break out within the states and we wouldn't be able to really coordinate activities that a central government could do, especially in terms of banking. So Alexander Hamilton, Thomas Jefferson, and James Madison fought and fought and fought, and we ended up with a, with a government that looked like a compromise where there was some centralization and there was a lot of state power. And in terms of banking, state power won. People were very afraid of banks years ago. They didn't trust them. And the last thing they wanted was, was a system of large banks. So that's how the states got their power. In the banking system. So what that meant was there was no national banks, there was no central authority regulating banks, the authority over the banking system came from the individual states, many individual states wanted small banks, they wanted banks limited to just one branch. And so when you have banks that are just limited to one branch, you need to have a lot, a lot of banks spread across the country to handle the banking. Especially then when when business was done with horse and wagon, and there was nothing electronic. Banks needed to be in every corner of a county within every state. So if you recall, this is why we had no single currency in this country. In fact, we had thousands of different types of currency in this country called banknotes. Each bank issued their own notes. So if you had silver coins, gold coins, bullion, you would deposit in a bank, and the bank would give you a bank note that you could use for trade. We talked about how difficult it was to transact business when you didn't know what type of money you were getting. You could have got bank notes from three states away. You didn't know if the bank even existed. You didn't know if the bank went bankrupt. And so you really had to trust the people handing over those bank notes. Many of those bank notes 
traded at substantial discounts, especially as he got farther and further away from the bank in which the notes were issued. Now, let's fast forward to the National Banking Act of 1863 and 1864. That is a point where we created a uniform currency in this country, and they were called greenbacks. And the reason for the National Bank Act of 1863 was to create a uniform currency, and the National Bank Act of 1864 created a national banking system, which created the OCC, the Office of the Controller of Currency, which still exists today. The whole motivation for these bank acts had to do with funding the Civil War. The government wanted to issue bonds to finance the war, but how can you sell bonds when there's all these different currencies out there? What's the denomination of these bonds? Remember, bonds are basically IOUs. And then let's say the, the government, the federal government sold these bonds, collected all these various banknotes. How would they use them to finance the war, to buy supplies for the war? Those currencies had different values. They were changing all the time. People didn't trust them. And so the federal government really couldn't deal with all those different banknotes. A single currency was the solution to the problem. So one of the major goals of the, of the National Bank Act was to create a single currency. And the way they were going to do that was they were going to tax state banknotes out of existence. So any banknotes that were issued by states would have a 10% tax. And they figured, well, if we tax those banknotes, we'll tax them out of existence. And if we tax them out of existence, we'll tax the state banks out of existence also. They won't be able to, to conduct business. Or they'll fold into national banks, realizing that they could not operate under such a heavy tax burden. What came next out of the state banks is fascinating. What the state banks decided to do was not issue bank notes, but to issue checks. Checks were relatively new in this country, and what they meant was issued checks that were not subject to the 10% bank note tax. It turned out that checks were extremely popular, and so while state bank notes disappeared because of the tax, state banks did not because they had checks and, che and a checking system. The end result of all of this is that we ended up with a national banking system and a state banking system. A state banking system we had lots and lots of banks. And by the way, when the national banking system came into play, as a compromise with the states, the national banks were restricted to only having a single building. This way, the states wouldn't be nervous about a national bank starting to take over the country, a huge multinational bank. So national banks were just restricted to one single building. So now, what we ended up with is a dual banking system, national banking system and a state banking system with thousands of banks. So we started a country in the 1700s with practically no banks. And in, a, in about 80 years, we ended up with thousands and thousands of banks across the country. And what happened after that was the national banks tended to have higher reserve requirements they were nationally controlled by the, the OCC, but the state banks often competed against each other. In other words, the states competed against each other for banking services. So many states lowered reserve requirements to attract banks into their state and to have lots of banks because banks facilitate transactions. So remember, low reserve requirements are like a low tax to a bank. So banks love to have low reserve requirements. But the problem was when there was a banking problem, an economic issue or economic downturn, those banks were unstable because when there was a bank run, they often were depleted of money very, very quickly. As a result of the low reserve requirements, what happened was a lot of national banks ended up flipping over to state banks. And so we had lots and lots of state banks and only a few national banks. And what the McFadden Act in 1927, I just fast forward a bunch of decades, I understand that. The McFadden Act of 1927 sought to equalize the banking system so that national banks had to comply with state bank regulations. In other words, national banks were put on an equal footing with the state banks. Another thing the McFadden Act did was it outlawed interstate banking, which means banks could only work in one state. They were only allowed to do business in one state. They couldn't do business in 
across lines in another state. The problem with the McFadden Act was it left a loophole in its regulations. And the loophole had to do with bank holding companies. Now, bank holding companies and holding companies in general have been around for a long time. And a holding company basically is a company that owns other companies. And in terms of bank holding companies, a bank holding company is a company that's not necessarily a bank. It's usually not a bank, but it's a company that owns lots of banks. I worked for a bank holding company. We were not a bank, but we owned and managed about a dozen banks at one time. Well, the McFadden Act did not address bank holding companies. And by not addressing bank holding companies, it actually created a loophole. Because what some banks started to see was, well, we, don't, we won't actually buy a branch in another state. What we'll do is we'll open up an entire another bank in another state. And what we'll do is we'll form a bank holding company. We'll form a bank holding company, and that bank holding company can now own banks in several states. They won't be called branches. They'll just be labeled banks in other states. The Bank Holding Company Act in 1956 closed that loophole, but it also allowed states to have interstate banking through bank holding companies if the states reciprocated. And what that means is state A, for example, will only allow banks from state B to come in if state B also allows state A banks into its state, a reciprocity agreement. So I barely scratched the surface on bank geographic restrictions. There's a long history, obviously. It goes back to the 1700s. It's complicated. It's involved. It's political. And it ended up creating a dual banking system with national banks, state banks. And by the time 1956 rolled around, we had over 13,000 banks in existence at that time. And one of the implications of geographic restrictions is this. That's an important thing to note before we move on. Geographic restrictions prevented banks from diversifying geographically. So what that means is banks were tied to their local economy. If their local economy tanked, so did the bank usually. And that was a problem. There was no diversification. If a large mill in a town closed then it was likely that the town's banks would go bankrupt because its loans would go in default as, as unemployment increased and its capital would erode. There could be a bank run before we had the FDIC or even, even after the FDIC, there were still some bank runs. But in any case, the bank would likely lose its capital from loan losses, from concentrating its loan portfolio in the local economy. So fast forward to 1994 and the Rigel Neal Interstate Banking Act ended up eliminating interstate banking restrictions and allowed banking across state lines. Finally, it only took a little over 200 years to get interstate banking. And by the way, banks have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger since. So if you look at the distribution of banks, the top 15 banks in the United States hold over 50% of the deposits among banks and savings and loans in total. So now we have another problem in this country, and it's called too big to fail. And that's caused by regulatory moral hazard. And what I mean by that is, in the past, the government has bailed out very large financial institutions because if those large financial institutions go under, they're likely to pull down the entire banking system because of their size. So they're called too big to fail. The government won't let them fail. And people realize that these banks are too big to fail. So they rather put their deposits in a really large bank than a small bank that might fail. Even though it's FDIC, they still end up wanting to do business with the larger banks. That's just another example of how regulations in the regulatory environment can actually cause problems. So now let's talk about interest rate regulations. In other words, interest rate ceilings. We don't have to go back to revolutionary times to get a handle on this. We need to go back to the Great Depression. That's when interest rate ceilings began through the Banking Act of 1933 and Regulation Q, which was controlled by the Fed. It basically imposed an interest rate ceiling on demand deposits, checkable deposits, in other words, at 0%. In other words, banks could not pay any interest rate on checkable deposits. And there was interest rate ceilings on savings and time deposits. And with time deposits, those ceilings varied depending on maturity. 
Now, fast forward to 1980, and those interest rate ceilings disappeared for the most part, except on demand deposits. So the Depository Institution's Deregulation and Monetary Act of 1980 phased out interest rate ceilings on everything except demand deposits. So like I said, demand deposits still had an interest rate of 0% as a max. That was not eliminated until Dodd-Frank in 2011. We'll have a lot more to say about Dodd-Frank. It's an extensive set of regulations that have a lot of implications for financial institutions. We'll do that in a separate video. Interest rate ceilings strangled banks and savings and loans. When interest rates started to go high in our economy, basically the 1960s, 70s, and early 80s, interest rates went above the ceilings. Banks could not offer those high rates, so consumers started to pool their money out of banks. And if banks don't get money through deposits, how are they going to be able to make loans? So the banking institutions, including savings and loans, were in trouble because of these interest rate ceilings. These interest rate ceilings were imposed to keep banks from competing themselves out of business by paying high interest rates. So the thought was, look, this was 1933, the Great Depression. We had just started up the FDIC, and the FDIC was coming on board. And regulators thought that well, you know, if banks start paying high interest rates, they'll compete themselves out of business, they'll go bankrupt, and it'll put the deposit fund, the, the FDIC's insurance fund, in jeopardy. So that was the motivation for the interest rate ceilings that existed, but nobody foresaw at that time the very high interest rates we would have in our economy due to high inflation in the 70s and early 80s. Now, Keep in mind, recall that interest rate ceilings as well as reserve requirements are like taxes on banks. And so what happened was money started to flow overseas and stay overseas. So you gotta keep in mind that there's a lot of international companies and a lot of transactions being done in US dollars. Well, if you're doing business overseas in dollars, why not keep that money overseas rather than repatriate it and bring it back into the US? And how was that done? Well. People kept their money offshore from the United States through euro dollar deposit accounts. Euro dollar deposit accounts or deposit accounts, kind of like CDs, where you deposit your money, say, in a London bank account, and you earn an interest rate called LIBOR, the London International Bank Rate. It's where you deposit dollars in an account, in a bank account, in a foreign country. And so if you're in if you're a multinational and you're headquartered in the United States, you could have euro dollar deposit accounts in Europe and not have to worry about any exchange rate fluctuations. And not only that, but these deposits were not regulated in terms of interest rate ceilings. So when we had interest rate ceilings and interest rates started to skyrocket onshore in the United States, well, these euro deposit markets started to take off because people put their money in those accounts they paid higher interest rates. Not only that, but a lot of foreign money that was held in money center banks in New York were taken offshore by these same banks via their foreign branches. While the euro dollar deposit market is quite interesting, the mechanics behind how it works is a little more complex and involved. It's best discussed in an international finance course because it's gonna take us off track for this particular course on financial institutions and markets. So what I want to do now is talk about not the mechanics of euro dollar deposits, but look at the interest rate associated with euro dollar deposits. The interest rate on euro dollar deposits are called LIBOR, the London International Bank Offering Rate, LIBOR. And those deposits and those rates are associated with 30-day deposits, 60-day deposits, 90-day deposits, and so on. And they are some of the most important interest rates in the world. Trillions of dollars of derivatives, meaning options, futures, and swap contracts, which are discussed in financial engineering course, are linked to LIBOR. So LIBOR is called a reference rate because derivatives base their pricing off of that interest rate. And there's even a method called the LIBOR discounting method used for swaps and interest rate derivatives, which are covered again in financial engineering. Now, LIBOR has been around for a long time. It's almost ubiquitous in the finance world. It's used throughout the finance world as a reference rate. Like I said, trillions of dollars are tied up into this. 
But you know, what happened was quite interesting. So the euro dollar market grew over many, many years and it had associated with it this LIBOR interest rate. Now what's really interesting is nobody is really watching or paying attention to how this LIBOR rate was computed. The LIBOR rate was an average and it was based on an average of, of various banks in London. So individuals would go and at, at financial institutions in London, they would survey these large banks and say, you know, what are you paying on your deposits? And they take those maybe a dozen different estimates from the survey and average them out, and then that would be the published LIBOR. Well, the problem with that is it was subject to scandal, and that's exactly what happened in the Great Recession. In the Great Recession, financial institutions were really rocked. They were doing poorly, and the people who surveyed and did the averaging of LIBOR shaded the estimates to make their financial institutions look better. Because these individuals knew the financial positions that they had in options, futures, and swap contracts and the markets and the exposure that these financial institutions had to LIBOR. And so what they did was they shaded the estimates in favor of their financial institutions. And so they published interest rates that were not accurate, that were fraudulently computed. And the funny thing is, trillions of dollars of derivative instruments and financial instruments, mainly interest rate type products, were based, were referenced based on this LIBOR rate. Even consumer loans, credit cards, and mortgages were subject to these LIBOR rates. And so when this scandal came to light, it rocked the financial world. And then people started questioning, well, you know, how is LIBOR computed? And, you know, where is the where are the risks associated with those calculations? And then it was uncovered and people were, were kind of shocked that there was so little oversight over the calculation of LIBOR, which covered trillions of dollars in financial instruments. LIBOR is now calculated by the ICE exchange, the Intercontinental Exchange. The Intercontinental Exchange owns numerous clearing houses and exchanges, including the New York Stock Exchange. Needless to say, there's a lot of oversight on the calculation of LIBOR and regulations now overseeing LIBOR that didn't exist before the Great Recession. Because of the scandal and the survey-based estimates for LIBOR, people looked at that as a weakness in the calculation. And so what, what people sought to do now is to get rid of LIBOR and substitute it for another interest rate an interest rate that's based on actual transactions rather than a survey format. So a lot of research has been done on this and the, where it's heading to now is LIBOR will disappear as a reference rate and what will go in its place is called SOFR, S-O-F-R, Secured Overnight Funding Rate. That'll come into play by 2022. So the entire financial world is trying to transform itself out of LIBOR into SOFR. It's not that easy. The rate will be a bit different, but really this SOFR rate is essentially a risk-free rate. It's not quite a risk-free rate, but it's pretty close. So let's look at what it means, SOFR. Secured, that means there's collateral underneath this, the, the transaction. Overnight funding rate. It's borrowing and lending overnight with collateral such as treasury securities to back up the loans. And so since there's treasuries that back up the loans, it's risk-free or considered close to risk-free. And there are risk-free repos. We're talking about repos here. These are overnight lending actual transactions, not something that's surveyed by telephone or by email but based on actual interest rates and transactions. That's a big difference. So the transition from LIBOR to SOFR is being headed up in part by the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve is deeply interested in how this is calculated, and the Federal Reserve is involved in these repo transactions that determine a specific interest rate, the SOFR. Now, the interesting thing is SOFR is a daily interest rate. It's not like a euro deposit rate. In other words, there are euro deposit rates for about seven terms. In other words, 30 days, 60 day, 90 day, and so on, all the way up to 360 day. So there's seven different euro deposit rates, LIBOR rates. 
Well, with the SOFR, there's only one rate. It's a daily rate. And it's basically a risk-free rate. There's no term premiums on there, for example, because it's only overnight. It's not like it's six months or a year in deposit. So look for that coming in the future. We'll see SOFR more discussed more and more. And especially we'll be using it in financial engineering as time goes on. So now what we want to do is move on to international banking. And we want to talk about international banking onshore, meaning actual banking that's done within the United States. When we're talking about the euro dollar deposit market, that's sometimes referred to as offshore activities because it was done outside of the United States mainly in London, didn't have to be in London, though that your dollar deposit market, by the way, is in Asia, it's in Canada, it's in other countries around the world. It's not specific to, Euro, to the euro market. That's just where it, it originated. So now getting back to onshore foreign banking, we have a number of foreign banks in the United States. And for a long time, those foreign banks were not subject to the same regulation that American banks had. These banks had no reserve requirements when they were in the United States, and they were not FDIC insured. Well, right there, you see that there's two taxes that they weren't exposed to. American banks were exposed to reserve requirements and FDIC insurance tax. So, by the way, the FDIC charges banks premium for that insurance. So it's not just free to a bank. It's based on the deposits that, that a bank has. So in any case, these foreign banks had no reserve requirements. They're not FDIC insured. So they really weren't as regulated as American banks. And that put American banks at a disadvantage. It, it somewhat balances out in a sense, especially with FDIC insurance. Okay, so these foreign banks didn't have FDIC insurance, didn't have to pay the premium but they weren't insured either, so that had to hurt their deposit base to some degree. But the other thing that was interesting is these foreign banks, since they were subject to less regulations, they could actually branch across state lines and do interstate banking, where American banks weren't able to do interstate banking. Well, in 1978, the International Banking Act sought to equalize foreign and American banks onshore banking. And so while the regulations may not be exactly the same from an onshore American bank versus a foreign bank, they're much more on a level playing field than they were before because of the 1978 International Banking Act. So now what we want to ask is, well, how, how do you get into foreign banking, international banking? So how does an American bank expand outside the U.S.? Well, there's several ways you can do it. You can actually go and buy, a, a, an American bank can buy a foreign bank or they can open up a foreign branch. And then obviously, when you open up a foreign branch or a foreign bank, it's going to be subject to the host market's regulations. The other way that a, an American bank can enter into the international banking arena is to operate through the EDGE Act. The EDGE Act came about in 1918 or 1919 originally and it was designed to get American banks more involved in international trade and financing of international trade. The EDGE Act was then amended in the 1970s so that national banks in the United States could open up banks through, through national banks. They could open up banks in foreign countries. And so since they were national banks, remember the banks that are covered by the OCC, the Office of the Comptroller of Currency, and through these national banks, they're not subject to state laws. But host country laws apply then, like we saw before. Obviously, if, if you're dealing in transactions in another country and you're opening up a business in another country, you're subject to those regulations. So let's discuss deposit insurance now. Deposit insurance came about in the Great Depression under the Banking Act of 1933, also known as Glass-Steagall, the same act that covered interest rate ceilings. Deposit insurance came about during the Great Depression because of all the bank runs that were happening. And we'll talk about bank runs in, in a minute. But it's important to realize that right now, in today's world, we have $250,000 insurance, FDIC insurance, per depositor, per FDIC insured bank account, per ownership category. And the various ownership categories are single account, joint account, and so on. 
the full list is on the slide. So let's get back to the question of bank runs. Why do they occur? Well, remember, back in the, in the Great Depression, unemployment jumped up to about 25%. Lots of businesses failed, individuals failed, and banks lost money through their loans. Banks extended loans that essentially went bad, it ate away their capital. And so banks and the economy in general were failing. Okay, well, what did that do? Well, that caused people to be really nervous about the banks that they were dealing with and, and banks that they had deposits in. Because at that time, there was no FDIC insurance. And if a bank failed, you could lose all of your savings. So as soon as there was a rumor that a bank was to fail, even if it wasn't, it would end up failing anyway because people would line up immediately to pull their money out. And the people who were lined up first were more likely to get their money than the people who were at the end of the line because it was a first come, first serve basis. And we're talking about demand deposits, deposits that that the bank is required to pay out on demand. Okay, given this situation, let's see if we can fold this into the asymmetric information, adverse selection, and moral hazard framework that we developed earlier in this course. And if you recall, when we talked about those concepts, we talked about it in terms of lending. But there's asymmetric information in the environment, which is fairly normal, and lenders, like banks, are very leery about lending money to individuals without knowing some information about their background. And so their goal of, of lending is to mitigate that asymmetric information problem, which leads to adverse selection. So remember what adverse selection is on the lending side. It means that the people who are most likely not going to pay back the bank are the people who are going to want their money or going to look to a bank to fund them. And so banks need to be very leery that the people that are knocking on their door are the ones that are not likely to pay back their loans. That's adverse selection. It happens before the loan is made. And so banks want to mitigate that adverse selection problem by doing an extensive credit review. And then don't forget the moral hazard issue with respect to lending. And that happens after the loan is made. So the loan is made, an, inv an individual could go out and gamble with the money. And so what the banker tries to do is try to monitor the situation, like how much money is in this firm's bank account or this individual's bank account. Let's visit the business. Let's visit the operation and make sure things are going smoothly and try to mitigate the moral hazard issues. And it's just getting to know the reputation of the individual or the firm. Keep in mind, remember we talked about the idea that banks are really good at keeping this information private. So there's no free rider problem. The information that a bank has, it keeps. And that's how it can earn a return from lending because it's very skilled at collecting information and gathering it and keeping it within the bank and private. That's a very important concept. It's important because from a depositor's perspective, if we're putting money in our bank, we really don't know what the bank is doing in terms of its lending. Is it making good loans? Is it making bad loans? Really don't know. So now let's look at the other side of the balance sheet in terms of asymmetric information, adverse selection, and moral hazard. So now we're talking about the deposit side, people like you and I depositing our money in a bank. So now keep in mind that most financial transactions like a deposit are based on an extensive credit review at the counterparty. So what we should be doing as individuals, we should be looking at the bank and doing a credit review of the bank before we deposited money into the bank. Because it's like any other business. How do you know if you put your money in a bank that you're going to get your money back? Because maybe the bank is highly risky. So we should, under normal circumstances, do a credit review. But you know, most people are not qualified to do a credit review of the bank. And even if they were qualified to do a credit review of the bank, they're really not going to get too far because banks keep that information about their lending situations and their business private. So what we have here is a situation of asymmetric information. You and I don't know the real quality of a bank. And we're going to put our money in the bank. We're kind of nervous about that. But now, when we have FDIC insurance, we don't need to perform a credit review. We don't care about a credit review because, look, 200, up to $250,000 per account per depositor is being insured. So we're, we're not concerned about a credit review and whether or not the bank fails because if it fails, the FDIC will simply pay us off.
But that in and of itself creates a moral hazard problem. And what I mean by that is, look, normally individuals would apply what's called market discipline. So normally businesses and individuals, before they deposit their money, would do a review of the bank. And if they thought the bank was risky, they would ask for a risk premium associated with the return they got from the deposit. They wouldn't part with their money unless they would get a good risk premium. And a bank that's less risky, then it would have a lower risk premium and probably would attract more deposits. That's what we mean by market discipline. But when you have FDIC insurance and depositors like you and I are not doing credit reviews, the bank is not subject to market discipline. The bank can act in a very risky manner and still obtain plenty of funding from deposits. And that very risky manner could cause our deposits to be in jeopardy. That's why the FDIC and the Fed and the OCC regulate banks heavily. They require financial statements periodically, and they actually come in and do bank audits. So I worked at a bank holding company for a bunch of years. We had auditors in every year from the various regulators. Do an audit, check our books, look to see the quality of our loan portfolio, especially focusing on the quality of our loan portfolio to mitigate the asymmetric information and that moral hazard. Because if we were acting risky as a bank or a bank holding company, then we could jeopardize the entire financial system and the entire banking financial system. Because if we go under as a big bank, we would likely pull, pull down other banks. Now, let's talk about shift gears just a little bit and talk about the resolution of failed banks. If we're talking about a small bank that has failed, there's two things that a, the FDIC can do to handle a failed bank. And that is, it could close the bank and pay off the depositors up to the $250,000 limit. FDIC tends not to want to do that. It's a little messy. It costs money. It costs taxpayers money. So the other method, which is, more, which is preferable for the FDIC, is the FDIC will arrange for a larger bank to take over the failed bank. And the larger bank will take over the failed bank under FDIC guidance. And the FDIC's guidance really will be make sure that all the depositors are covered that are in, are in this failed bank. And then the FDIC will approve the, the larger bank taking over the smaller failed bank. And everybody's made whole. Sometimes it's so seamless, you don't even know it happens. It says a depositor, your bank could fail, can be taken over. And then, you know, next thing you know, there's a, there's a name change. And you really don't really question, well, why was there a name change? Oh, it could have literally failed. And the bank just, and the FDIC simply arranged for a takeover. So now there's another method that applies to big banks. Big banks are different. They're handled differently. Since big banks are highly connected, and the, the idea is that the bigger the bank, the more connected you are to the economy. And if a big bank fails, it's more likely to create more systemic risk. The FDIC is highly concerned about that. Actually, that's an understatement. The entire world is concerned about big banks failing. In those cases, the FDIC will prop up, the, the FDIC and the Fed and other regulators will prop up the bank because the bank is what's called too big to fail. And the concept of too big to fail, we'll talk about when we talk about, when we get into the Dodd-Frank Act that happened after the Great Recession. It's a separate topic in and of itself. So that about covers it for deposit insurance. In this section of the video, I want to review bank capital and its purpose, and then I'll move on to bank capital requirements. Now remember, Bank capital is a buffer against losses. So if a bank starts to experience losses in an economic downturn, its loans start to go bad, how much of a buffer does it have before it goes bankrupt? Well, that's what capital measures. And so a measure of capital for a bank, a very crude measure, is your capital to total asset ratio. That ratio is a good measure of leverage in and of itself, but it really doesn't tell you how risky the underlying bank is in terms of the type of assets it's invested in. And not only that, but what about the off-balance sheet items that the bank has committed to, like off-balance sheet lines of credit? Now let's take a look at bank capital requirements. We don't have to go back to revolutionary times or the Great Depression. 
to see how this story unfolds. The story basically unfolds in the 1980s when academics and regulators and people in, in the banking industry began to realize that capital ratios that we were using, for example, the capital to total asset ratio, which is, you know, capital is the equity of the bank, and then the primary capital, the total asset ratio, where primary capital is common equity plus the loan loss reserve. So remember, if you take a loan loss reserve and reduce the income of the bank, which reduced retained earnings or reduced common equity. So you take your common equity plus your reserves for loan losses, add perpetual preferred stock, and that's your primary capital, and divide that by total assets to arrive at a primary capital ratio. So I realize what I just said really won't translate very well unless you see a visualization of what I'm talking about. So let's do it. Here we have a bank balance sheet. I'm going to put in reserves. We don't really need to know it and see that, but I'm going to put it in anyway just to give it a little more context. So here we have a bank balance sheet, deposits, demand deposits of 90, reserves of 9, so we meet a re our reserve requirement. Let's say loans are 91, and obviously that means bank equity or capital will be $10. Total assets? 100 liabilities and equity 100 our balance sheet balances things look nice we have a 10 to 100 capital ratio you know that primitive capital ratio of 10 percent so everything's good now let's look at what happens when a bank extends some loans and they go bad which is the normal course of business every quarter banks charge off loans because they've extended some loans to people who didn't pay it back, businesses that did not pay back the, the money. So how do banks handle that accounting? And how does it affect capital ratios? That's what we want to look at here. Well, let's start off by saying, look, get a different color here. So the way I have it written down here is that there's no loan loss provision set up here. I'm just saying, look, these are $91 in loans and they're all good. But, you know, generally accepted accounting principles require that you set up a loan loss provision for potential loan losses that you foresee and you estimate and you need to project. So conservatism calls for that provision. So what that provision would look like, or it's basically a reserve at this case, a reserve for loan loss. So this is a reserve for loan loss. And let's say it's $5. And I'm putting it in as a negative. And what happens is we get this net loans now of $86. That's really the value of our loans. Once we, once we chop off $5 worth of loans that we're pretty sure go go bad in the future. But now, you know, wait a second, balance sheet doesn't balance. I chop $5 off here. Where does the other $5 come into play? Well, it's going to reduce your capital here. And how does it do that? Well, here's your income statement. And you remember, you have interest income, which I'm not going to specify. You don't really need to see that. Interest expense, and then you have spread, which is your net interest margin. And then you're going to have, see this loan loss reserve? It's basically, there's a what's called a provision for loan loss reserve. And that's going to be a $5 expense on your income statement, which means your net income is going to be reduced by $5. Now, before I go further, let's make sure we get a handle on what's the difference between a reserve for loan loss and a provision for loan loss. Well, there is an account called loan loss reserves. Okay? And that's what this is, loan loss reserves. And how, how does that work? Well, you have a beginning balance for your loan loss reserves, which I had set to zero before I started to put this account in here. And then we have a provision for loan loss, which I just set at five here. And there's, there you see the provision also here. And so then you have what's called charge offs. A charge off is when you actually write off a loan. So here, this is just a projection that needs to get run through the balance sheet and the income statement here. It's just the pro projection of some loans. We don't know what exactly. We kind of have an idea, but we don't know if they're actually going to go bad. 
right? And then what happens is later on, when we actually figure out which loans go bad, that's a charge off. So at this point, we're not doing any charge offs. And what we now have is an ending balance of the loan losses of this reserve for loan losses of $5. There it is. That's the ending balance. This is basically a contra. This is a contra asset account. So these are assets, but it shows up as a negative on the asset side of the balance sheet. It's a contra asset. Now, back to how does this reduce capital? Well, we've seen this before. You've seen this in accounting. You have retained earnings, which are part of your capital, and that's going to have a beginning balance, right? And then it's going to have net income as an addition to it. And then when you add those together, you get what's called available. Available for what? It's retained earnings available for dividends. And then you subtract out dividends and you have an ending balance, which you carry forward for the next period when you do your balance sheet. Well, notice what happened. We reduced net income of $5. So net income now is down $5. So your ending balance and retained earnings are down by $5. And I'm ignoring taxes. Let's not get tangled up in that mess. So uh, we have a drop in $5 here. So now your capital is $5. So we we reduced the asset side here by five dollars we reduced the capital by five dollars and now we have 95 95 things balanced but notice this bank has half the capital it had before because of bad loans so now you ought to be able to see why we have this thing called primary capital so primary capital equals your common equity here plus your which includes your retained earnings by the way plus your loan loss reserves here because look if if you reduce your common equity by this five dollars well you've reduced your loans already here and then you add preferred stock. I didn't model preferred stock, but preferred stock would go right in at that point because it's kind of like an in-between like debt because it's, you know, it's preferred dividends are preferred. They need to be paid before you pay common stockholders. And so it's sort of like a blend between debt and common equity. And it's usually posed right here. So your primary capital would be that common equity plus your loan losses or plus this preferred stock. So the point is, by setting up that provision, we reduced common equity by $5, but we boosted up our loan loss reserve by the $5. So the fact that we've reduced loans by 5 here to get to 86 means that we're set up and we've reserved ourselves against these $5 in loan losses. And so what will happen is, in the future, if these actual loans go bad, if those loans go bad, what we're going to do is we're going to charge them off. And we would charge those off the next period. So this period, we, we set up the loan loss reserve thinking, okay, next period we're going to have some losses. We actually charge them off. So what happens is now this ending balance is a beginning balance for the reserve, for the loan loss reserve. And then let's say we have a provision of zero. So this will be five, carrying this five over. Let's just say no provision this period. And then we have charge-offs of minus five. Now we have a reserve, a loan loss reserve of zero. And when you have a charge-off of five dollars, that means your loans are now reduced by five dollars. Notice we didn't reduce loans. This level, this line item stayed the same when we set up this provision here. So we reduce loans, and so at the next period, our loans will be $86, this will be zero, and we'll have a net loans, which will be 86 also. So it still balances at 95. Now, you know, there's a little detail here from an accounting prospect. I, you know, not only did I work in a, in a bank holding company for five years, I was a senior financial analyst and a CPA. This is what I did for a living for five years. So I don't expect you to fully get it, but my point is here is that you can't fully understand bank regulation without understanding how banks account for loan losses and its effect on the balance sheet and income statement and capital, especially capital here in this section of the video. And how do these loan loss provisions impact capital? 
And why does the primary capital ratio have a loan loss reserve? Now you should be able to answer that question. So now, before we leave this slide, it's important to realize that these very simple capital ratios, believe it or not, very simple capital ratios, were being gamed by banks. And what I mean by gamed by banks is banks were being rather innovative in skirting around these regulations so that they met the capital requirements, but at the same time were a bit more risky. So before we go any further, let's make sure we have the background that bankers always want to increase profits. And they often do that by taking on more risks. So always keep that in the, in the back of your mind as we're going through these ratios. So capital ratios put the brakes on risk taking. And the capital ratios that I just showed you, the total capital ratio to total assets and then the primary capital ratio, they're good at measuring leverage and they reduced how much leverage that the banks were taking on. But it actually spurred risk in other ways, risk taking in other ways for banks. What it caused was it caused banks to invest in more risky loans and more risky assets and also to move some of their activities off balance sheet. So keep in mind that the denominator of this ratio is total assets. Well, that means it's on the balance sheet if it's part of total assets. If you can move some of your commitments and some of your items off balance sheet, well, then you're gaming the system and you're, you're reducing your total asset numbers so that your capital ratio looks higher. So what we're seeing is a form of moral hazard. The regulators put together minimum capital ratios. Let's say, you know, the capital ratio is 6%. Banks realize that, they know how it's calculated, and then they start gaming the system after the fact. And they start wiggling around the rules and requirements to boost their profits and to make their capital ratios look better so they can actually be a bit more leveraged than these capital ratios would indicate. In 1988, the Basel Accord, with Basel is a is a town in Switzerland. This accord was composed of bankers and central bankers, and it was established to develop a better set of capital requirements. The rules were voluntarily adopted by bank regulators around the world. So the goal of these risk-based capital requirements was to penalize banks for risk-taking. Well, what type of risk-taking? Well, excessive leverage, highly risky loans and investments, and also off-balance sheet items. So according to the Basel 1, and by the way, I'll get to it in a minute, there's Basel 1, 1988, there's Basel 2, and then there's a Basel 3, which we'll get to. We'll just talk about briefly. But in Basel 1, the goal was that the more risky the bank's assets, the lower the capital ratio. But how do you go about doing that? Well, bottom line, it's not that hard once you see it. Since the denominator of those capital ratios is total assets. So why don't we penalize banks that have highly risky assets and give those assets a high weight and give the assets that have no risk or very little risk a low weight. So if, if you are a bank with high risks, then your total asset number, your risk weighted total asset number will be high and your capital ratio will be low. Let's do an example and we'll consider two banks to hit this home so it's clear as to how these things work. And this is just a hypothetical example, but it gives you the context and it gives you the background, I think, of what you need to know about these ratios. So we have banks A and B, and they have the same total capital to total asset ratio, and it's 10%. So let's just focus on that because it's easiest to calculate. Then we'll have, we have bank A, and bank A is invested in low-risk loans in general, so it's kind of low risk. Bank B is invested more in high-risk loans. Which bank can better withstand a crisis? Well, let's look at the details of the example. So here we have bank A and B. Both banks have $100 million in total assets, which means their liabilities and capital also equal $100 million. Now, just as a little background, the, reserve, the reserves there, $9 million, are based on a 10% reserve requirement with equitable deposits of $90 million. So we got a 10% reserve requirement. We meet that just as a, as a side note there. The capital, the total asset ratio for each bank is $10 million because each bank has $10 million divided by $100 million in total assets. Now, take a look at Bank A. Bank A has, you know, leaning towards more low-risk loans, and Bank B is leaning heavily towards high-risk loans. 
both banks have unused an unused line of credit of $40 million. And according to the little asterisk footnote there, the unused line of credit is a high-risk commitment. In other words, it's a commitment, it's a line of credit to a company or organization that's considered highly risky. So as you can see, if that's highly risky, if this line of credit gets drawn down and it goes bad, it could hurt the bank in the future. So now let's calculate a risk-weighted capital ratio. So here we have risk, the risk weights. We have zero risk assets get 0% weight, low risk, let's just assume, making this up as a hypothetical example, low risk has a 75% weight and high risk has 150% weight. Keep in mind, normally when we in finance, when we do weightings, the, the weights usually add up to one. As you can see here, the weights do not add up to one, and they're, they're not supposed to add up to one. Okay, as I said earlier, the bank's capital to total asset ratio is 10% for both banks. And so on the surface, they both look about equally as risky, and they both have about the same amount of capital buffer. 10% of their total assets is in capital, and that's to withstand banking shocks and economic downturns that may hurt the bank and cause it to go towards bankruptcy. Now, let's look at Bank A and let's calculate its risk-weighted capital ratio, okay, based on its balance sheet now. So capital is 10, and then we're going to divide that by the weight of zero for $9 in reserves plus a 75% weight on the low-risk assets of $57 million. And then the 1.5 weight for the 34 million in high risk loans, we end up with a risk weighted capital ratio just for the balance sheet of 10.67%. But that's not the whole picture. What regulators realized in the 80s was the off balance sheet items have risk. And so now if we include the off balance sheet items, we have a capital ratio of 6.5% for bank A. Look at the drop in the ratio, that's because we've multiplied 1.5 weight times 40 on those off balance sheet credit lines. Okay, so now let's compare it to Bank B. Bank B, we do the same calculations for, for a balance sheet and off balance sheet, and you see Bank B is penalized for the, for the higher risk that it's taking. And its capital ratios are a bit lower in both balance sheet and off balance sheet ratios. So obviously the Basel framework is far more complicated than the simple example I just showed you. You know, when, when the Basel Accord came out, I do remember this coming out. It was about 30 pages long, and it came out in 1988, but it wasn't effective until 1992. So, you know, they come out, and it takes a long time for banks to be able to implement it. So you just can't come out with a regulation today and expect banks to, to abide by it the next day. They have to get their system set up for it and they have to design and implement it. It takes years. And so that it was implemented in 1990, effective 1992. Then Basel II Accord, the Basel II came about and that was effective in 2008 and that was 251 pages. And in that Basel II, there were three categories that were important. One is to have minimum capital requirements to take care of credit risk, market credit risk is the possibility that loans go bad, investments go bad, market risk, in other words, whether or not there's a systemic change in the bond market and interest rate environment that's out there in the market, systematic risk, and that's market risk. And then there's operational risk. Yeah, and operational risk includes things that are pretty hard to measure. It has to do with misappropriation of assets, theft of information, hacking damage, forgery problems, workers' compensation issues, antitrust, improper trading, market manipulation, natural disasters, and vandalism associated with physical assets. Those are just several measures of operational risk. You know, those things are quite hard to measure. And by the way, you know, just think about it. Basel II came out just before the Great Recession took hold. And these regulators had no idea what was looming over their heads. In terms of liquidity risk, they're spending pages and pages on operational risks instead. Also included in Basel II was discussion of internal controls. Examples of internal control are segregation of duties. The people who handle cash don't also handle the books, the general ledger. It could be even, and I have from experience in this, if you work in a bank, 
you're required to take two weeks vacation so that somebody else could take over your job for a couple of weeks. And if one person is committing some type of fraudulent act, the person that steps in for those two for that two week period might be able to catch the problem. Moving on to the next item, transparency and also disclosure requirements. Moving on to Basel III, which came in right after the Great Recession. They added a liquidity risk requirement, finally, and a counter-cyclical capital buffer to the regs. Now, what are liquidity requirements? Well, liquidity requirements look at whether or not there's sufficient liquidity within the bank to endure a 30-day liquidity crisis. In other words, if liquidity dries up in the markets, does the bank have 30 days worth of liquidity to be able to operate? That's important because a lot of banks did not have that liquidity. They met the capital requirements, but didn't have the liquidity, meaning like things that can be translated into cash very quickly, like treasury bills, money market securities, short-term loans. They just didn't have that liquidity. So keep in mind that the liquidity requirement is not just about holding liquid assets. It's also about looking at the liabilities and the potential outflows. So does the bank have sufficient capital for deposit outflows and also for contingent loan commitments? In other words, will customers pull down loan commitments during a crisis and draw down, will customers draw down lines of credit in a crisis? Those things need to be planned out and tested, usually through a stress test where the bank, where the bank runs a simulated crisis to see whether or not they can withstand a crisis and the outflows that follow. Now, counter-cyclical capital is a little different now. It's a counter-cyclical buffer. And what that means is counter-cyclical. Here's what happens. Normally, when the economy does well, you know, banks don't need very much capital. And when the economy tanks and banks start losing lots of money, they need more capital. This works in the opposite direction. So when the economy does really well, banks are required to build up a buffer over and above the minimum capital requirements. And what that does is it prepares them for the next downswing in the cycle. And so when we hit a downswing, the buffer requirements are lifted. This counter-cyclical capital requirement is interesting because it's a, an example of a macro prudential regulation. It's designed to counteract the business cycle of the overall economy. So when you see macro prudential, macro means the overall economy. What it's doing is, is this. When the economy does well and banks are, tend to do a lot of lending and they extend a lot of credit to the economy, that causes an economic boom. The, econ the economy goes up and it actually is pro-cyclical, meaning that it tends to push the economy up even further when a bank extends credit during an economic boom. Well, if regulators tell banks that they have to boost their capital during an upswing, then that reduces their lending that they're going to do in an economic boom. It also does the exact opposite. When the economy drops down, banks are going to be allowed to extend more credit to try to help the economy pull out of the recession. So what's even more interesting is the timing of these increases and decreases in capital. When does it happen? Well, regulators are the ones that are gonna tell banks when to increase capital requirements during an economic boom. So they'll tell banks, okay, increase your capital, and the banks have up to a year to respond to that increase in capital. And then when the economy starts to turn down, usually the regulators are looking at loan volume when they're making these decisions on an aggregate basis. They're looking at overall loan volume in the economy. And so when they see loan, loan volume dropping off in the economy, then they're going to signal that well, capital requirements are now lower. And that signals the banks, you can increase your lending. And in effect, the, the hope here is that it's counter-cyclical for the overall economy. Now, failure to meet the buffer requirements result in automatic constraints on dividend payments, bonus payments, and share buybacks. These are payments to shareholders, money going out of the bank. In other words, capital going out of the bank. So a bank must meet its capital requirements before it makes capital distributions to shareholders. 
This was a politically contentious problem associated with banks during the Great Recession. Because what happened is some banks, after they got bailed out by the government, ended up paying large bonuses, doing share buybacks, paying out dividends to shareholders, and taxpayers got irate over the idea that basically the government was funding the dividends and the bonus payments and the share buybacks. And one more thing before we leave risk-based capital requirements. Risk-based capital requirement regs are probably the most complex regulations out of all the regulations that we covered. There are hundreds of pages as long as you saw earlier. They involve many definitions, are continuously evolving, depend on institutional size, and are often implemented in piecemeal. So you see an agreement that gets published and produced in one year. It's not for several years before it's actually implemented. Now let's move on to Glass-Steagall and the separation between investment banking and commercial banking. The story unfolds with the Glass-Steagall Act in the Banking Act of 1933 during the Great Depression. And before the Great Depression, banks could conduct commercial banking. That's the banking we're talking about where they can take deposits and make loans. They could also do investment banking, which is the underwriting of initial public offerings and merger and acquisition activity. And they could also provide brokerage services all under one roof. It produced a massive conflict of interest and abuse of power. Brokers within the organization gained inside knowledge from the investment banking side of the business and then traded on that insider information. And they gave it to their best clients. So think about it. You're doing commercial banking, which is the lending activities. You're doing investment banking, which is basically the buying and selling of businesses. And you're getting privy to a whole bunch of really important information. And then you're conducting brokerage services and making recommendations to your clients as to which securities to buy. Well, the brokers had a ton of information coming from their commercial banking counterparts and from their investment banking counterparts. They had a lot of insider information, and that's where the abuse came into play. So what we saw was heavy speculation in securities by banks. And we know this: the stock market crashed in 1929. Well, if you had a commercial bank that was about to get FDIC insurance, and it was dabbling in the securities business, what happens if the security business goes under? then the possibility of a bank going under would increase, which meant that the FDIC insurance fund would ultimately have to pay off depositors because of the brokerage and securities market, not because of commercial banking. Thus, under the Banking Act of 1933, investment banking and commercial banking were firewalled. National commercial banks could not own investment banks, and they had to spin off their brokerage units. But interestingly, the regulations called for national commercial banks to spin off their brokerage units and the firewall from investment banks. It did not restrict SNLs and it did not restrict state banks. And that created a loophole that eventually weakened the Glass Steagall Act over many, many years. Then in 1999, at the height of the dot com bubble, when people thought stocks would never drop, banks convinced Congress to repeal parts of the firewall, banks were complaining that, that they were not competitive. So what happened between 1933 and 1999? Well, in a nutshell, national commercial banks were pushed out of the brokerage business and out of the investment banking business, while savings and loans and state banks were allowed in that business. And not only that, but other financial institutions were allowed to buy banks, but banks weren't allowed to buy other types of financial institutions. That's why banks were able to convince Congress that they were at a competitive disadvantage. The Graham, Leach, Bliley Financial Service and Modernization Act in 1999 allowed security firms and insurance companies to purchase banks and allowed banks to underwrite insurance, underwrite securities, and transact in real estate. Interestingly, in the Great Recession now, 2008, top investment banks collapsed. Goldman Sachs turned itself into a bank holding company, believe it or not. Goldman Sachs was an investment bank that actually flipped into a holding company to, in order to get FDIC insurance because 
Goldman Sachs was worried that it was going to tank and go bankrupt in the Great Recession and that people or companies were going to pull their money out of Goldman Sachs. And so obtaining FDIC insurance stopped the collapse of Goldman Sachs. So the regulations I just discussed, if you actually read them, they're kind of boring. It's laborious. But if you have the history and the context for why those regulations were put together and an understanding of the financial statement analysis that goes on behind it, it becomes a little more palatable. And from a finance perspective, quite interesting at times.